Welcome to another episode of Marketing Cheat Codes. My name is Ed Briel. Super excited today to have somebody very special, and I, I say I don't say that lightly. Um, Tess Needham is um, head of content at WordPress VIP. WordPress VIP uh, partner of a Primo. And I just get super excited when I talk and get to meet other super creative people. Uh, so Tess, welcome to the pod. Thank you so much, Ed. It's really good to be here. Definitely. And uh, loved your uh, uh, Primo Sync presentation you did with Sam, our head of content. That was super mm -hmm. cool to see two heads of content sharing ideas um, and um, everything from content strategies to technology to just the, a day in the life. Uh, so definitely want to open that up. Uh, but Tess, you're, you know, when you're not rocking the content game, <laughs> you know, for WordPress VIP, mm -hmm. what are you doing? And, and I know there's also some other types of content you create as well. Um, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, it's, First of all, it's great to be here. It's uh, morning for me. I'm in Sydney, Australia, um, but we actually, I'm from here, as you can probably tell by my accent, but we lived in the Bay Area in San Francisco for 10 years and we just moved back to Australia last year. So um, sort of feel like a new person in my own country, which is a little bit strange. Um, but yeah, it's cool because I um, do have a bit more time in my day because of the time zone differences um, where I can kind of do explore my own projects a little bit more. So I'm a little bit of a creative jack of all trades, I would say. And I came to marketing kind of later in my career um, because I can't stick with one thing for too long. And yeah, I guess I, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess I just didn't realize that marketing is a place that embraces that. And I learned that kind of, um, I don't want to say too late. It was definitely wasn't too late, but you know, later. So yeah, it's been an awesome time with WordPress VIP. Um, I've been here for five years, over five years, um, but in the marketing team for three of those. And yeah, so when I'm not doing that, um, I do like blogging. Um, my, I, I try as much as I can to blog. It's, it's really enjoyable for me, but it is very time consuming. Um, and I just like doing anything creative. So I have a painting it's on the go at the moment. I'm looking at it. I stare at it every day and go, I want to have time to finish that painting. <laughs> um, I like to like draw and I do, um, voiceover acting just behind me is my booth that I, I heard. I heard some of those recordings. <laughs> Oh, They're really? awesome. Like <laughs> you can do so many varying voices. It's not just there's one test, but there's all these different characters you have. Yeah, it's so much fun. And I went to college for theater um, and I was there for a long time. I got a PhD in theater and this is just a way of sort of keeping a little bit of tabs with that, you know, the acting. And I did do it also a community theater production earlier this year, which was really fun. Um, but yeah, so I just, I don't know, like I have a lot of stuff on the go, <laughs> but, um, that was overwhelming me for a long time until I kind of realized that my thing is creativity. And as long as I'm like, I tried not now not to stress out too much about finishing a creative project or, you know, if I want to drop something and pick something else up, because I've just learned that the important thing for me is to be creative. So I try and bring that to work as well. I think that's, it's really important to me to bring your whole self to work. And I, Mm -hmm. always encourage that of my teammates. And the other thing I do is I'm a mom and I have two kids. I have two boys, they're eight and 10. So I love that this is cheat codes because we do a lot of gaming as a family. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up. Well, <laughs> talk me about some gaming. Yeah. Well, we're really into all of the Super Mario universe um, is our big thing. <clears throat> the kids are also very into Minecraft, which I like playing with them as well. Oh yeah. Um, so that's a good time. They're really into Pokemon. I, I got to say I struggle with Pokemon. I, I find it a bit boring. Um, but yeah, I, and I just like playing, you know, games for my own entertainment as well. I, I take a Nintendo Switch on the plane when I go traveling and um, yeah, I've just always liked it. So, but I was wondering, is a cheat codes even still a thing? Like in the modern day of gaming, maybe in PC gaming, I don't do PC gaming, I do console, but yeah. I don't know, like I remember in the old days having those old you know, Nintendo entertainment system. And you'd have all of those like BBAA up, down, start. And I don't, start, do, yeah. is it yeah. still a thing? I don't know. Tell me. I don't know. Like I'm trapped. Like the whole theme of this is trapped, like in that, like mid eighties, like early nineties mm -hmm. theme. I don't, you know, I really, I don't know. Um, but, um, so do you yeah, play the I, retro games? Oh yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. I, 
definitely play the retro games. Uh, my my game was Super Contra and Contra. I don't know. Remember oh, the guy running through the woods, uh-huh. um, killing the aliens, right. and uh, you could skip levels with the with the cheat codes. But uh, yeah. yeah, definitely the more nostalgic uh, games versus the. I'm not. I'm into the like more. The, the retro versus the the new school personally yeah i think like modern games now they they save as you go along and stuff and they're more like at least when i think about the mario games you can kind of pick them up and put them down whenever and i mean i have memories of playing the very first super mario game and having to stay up all night because you couldn't save it you know <laughs> you had to you had to just yeah. keep playing until you died yeah, so, I mean, we we sort of look at our children. I have three three daughters as well. Mm-hmm. I have kids, and you know, they they have their phones and they're in their face all the time and they're doing their thing. But whenever I was growing, it's hard to criticize because when I was growing up, yeah, I'd be awake for like three days, right? Like, <laughs> in, like two a.m., three a.m., still going playing like Super Mario Brothers or Contra, or just you know, trying to to crush the level. So I know you know You'd have to it, leave it paused or overnight if you wanted to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> and don't touch the Nintendo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, we have all time. the like soda pops around, you know, <laughs> and uh, food plates. Uh, going on a marathon binge gaming session. Oh yeah, totally. I think That's that probably still happens. Just looks a little bit different. It exactly, yeah. yeah. It just Be- it looks better quality graphics. Bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Love that. Now, <clears throat> um, I want to talk a little bit about. Um, some research that you chartered with uh, WordPress VIP mm-hmm. and I've got a content matter, your content matters, 2022 report, a mm-hmm. uh, lot of it's, it's chock full of insights. Um, and, you know, in here, you, you actually surveyed 800 plus content marketers. Uh, and what was interesting, one of the first things that, that sticks out is this idea of um, 82% of those companies are creating more content. Um, there's like this, you know, obviously content is needed for powering experiences, for driving commercial results, et cetera. Um, now there's almost like this, I'd like to know your, your take on the research. Obviously you've got a, a deeper understanding of uh, what those folks said and the, mm-hmm. the insights gleaned, but uh, there's almost like this, you know, a double-edged sword to more, Absolutely. I would say. Uh, what was some of the like maybe deeper click double click insights into the more of content creation that you were able to surface? Yeah, I think um, you know I, I don't think that it's that surprising this statistic because um, anyone who works in content knows that there is pressure to create more. Um, there's this feeling that you know the more content you create, the more people you're going to reach, the more that's going to translate into sales, and it's this kind of direct line um, and honestly, like the last thing that the market needs is just more content to add to all of the noise. Um, it's hard enough as a consumer, like I consume, I'm a content consumer as well. And it's hard enough to even catch up with my list of unlistened podcasts. Um, so I just, I don't know. I, it's, it's a really interesting dichotomy where for some reason we're all on this kind of hamster wheel of creating more content and also budgets, you know, budgets are higher, teams are bigger, there's just more, 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 more. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, like to what end, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't think it's necessarily, uh, it's inherently bad to create more content, but um, there was another stat in our report that talks about, you know, the number of people who actually don't know how their content is performing. So it's like creating all of this content yeah. and then like half of those people don't actually know how it's performing. And so you're just, like I said, on this hamster wheel um, and you're just putting more content out there and then that's more for your customers to wade through. So yeah, it's really like, I get it because I'm also in that same position, but at the same time, I sort of want to take just everyone take like a five minutes and just go right. take a breath. What are you doing this for? You know, let's get back to that. Are you just making content because everybody else is? Um, what do you actually think that you have to say and what can you um, say to reach your customers? So it also comes back to that strategy piece. And then, yeah, like, how are you going to know what's working and what's not working so that you can invest in the things that are working. Um, so yeah, I think our report kind of, while it wasn't surprising, it, it is interesting to just get some statistics around that um, to actually say, yeah, this is a real thing that's happening. Yeah. And one of the other things that came up was, you know, in terms of like the different media formats, video 
is was one of the biggest thing, one of the bigger yeah. types of content, you know, beyond blogging and some other, you know, con- uh, I'll call it uh, traditional content marketing mediums, a lot of video usage now. Yeah, well, video was the thing that people was on people's wish list to create more of if they had the resources. So that's the, the thing that they want to create more of. Um, we did ask, you know, what the blog posts and short articles were still the top form of oh, content yeah. that people are creating and videos was like fourth. But when we asked what people wanted to create more of, it was by far and away video, um, which is really interesting because, you know, the video tools that we have, I mean, we were talking about retro gaming and new gaming, like the incredible um, transformation that video tools have had as well mm-hmm. in the last 20 years um, where it's really gone now to anybody can be a video creator. Um, so the, the barrier to entry is much lower for video than it used to be. Um, but there is still, um, this feeling of like, I don't have the resources because yeah, it does take more resources to create. And as well, you don't want to just put out more video. That's the same as everything into the market. You want to do something that's very authentic to your company and that will actually get results. And I think that's, it's that same thing of like people seeing video out there and going, Oh, I want to do more video, but not really taking a step to go, well, why am I doing it? And how can I get started quickly? Um, with that low barrier to entry um, because the, the other, the flip side of that ubiquity of tools and the ease of entry for tools is, you know, maintaining brand standards and having some kind of strategy behind it. Otherwise you're just kind of throwing everything at the wall. Yeah. I mean, you know, sure. We want to, um, one of the, th- another trend I'm seeing, um, is, I'm not sure if it's directly in this report, but the report certainly surfaces this, which is this idea of, um, the brand creating content, but now even like s- some employees within the brand creating content, I'll call it non-traditional content marketers creating content for use in the, you know, top for taking that inside the organization, it, sort of more top of funnel with content creation. Are, are you also seeing that this sort of um, crowdsourcing within an organization is is taking hold to get more of like that humanized aspects of the brand out yeah for, sh- for sure like we're seeing more and more content creators and we're at a point now where like everyone has to be a content creator um and the more that you democratize that across your company um the more content that you can produce we get back now to that thing of <laughs> do we want to just create more content for the sake of it but um in my experience i've had a lot better results having internal folks creating content than having um, external, like engaging external agencies or contractors. Um, I think there's something really interesting about, especially for our type of company, it might not work for all companies, but um, what I love doing is surfacing the experts that we have in our company, um, in our content. Um, That does lots of things, right? It like gives you that expertise, that voice of expertise when you know, we have some of the most expert WordPress developers in the world working on our team and working on these really large scale enterprise WordPress sites. They have a ton of knowledge that they can share. Um, so you get that, you unlock that knowledge, which is really amazing. But then also you're sort of showing that um, you, uh, you these are the kinds of people that you'll interact with if you become a customer. So you're really highlighting your team that way. Um, and that sort of can exponentially, um, you know, grow your your base of um of thought leadership content but in a way that's really authentic i think i'm really yeah. i really get hung up on this idea of, of authenticity um it comes back to sort of my creativity as well where um i smell a rat really really quickly you know i don't want to just like pump out generic content for mm-hmm. the sake of getting words on the screen um for the sake of maybe capturing some google traffic i don't think that's the approach, at least for our company. And again, it's different for everyone, but um, the approach for us um, really needs to be, what do we have to say that's unique? How can we feature our team? How can we humanize it? Um, You know, in this world, that's a whole other can of worms, but in this world of increasingly AI tools and things like that, you know, how do we, how do we still humanize it and and give that human touch? And I, so I'm really passionate about um, 
about showcasing the subject matter experts on our team. And we've been doing a lot more of that recently. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's that getting that. And then in your research too, it was a lot of um, uh, top of funnel activities, right? Which, which is what the primary driver for creating content was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Awareness, education, uh, building a, a relationship and what better way to do that than to, than to put, to humanize it, put an actual, you know, person into the story. It's just that, that richness of, um, uh, authenticity and getting right to the expert, um, uh, building a relationship with the brand's experts well before you maybe even become a customer, um, is it could be a total game changer. Um, for sure. And for companies like ours that have a really long buying cycle and, you know, customers are not changing their CMS every month. So right. we, we really do need to maintain that level of brand awareness so that when you are ready to buy, you know, you've heard of us. Um, and we've been, um, so we've closed now the survey for the 2023 version of this um, report and we're writing it at the moment um, and doing all of the data crunching, which is Awesome. Challenging for me, but luckily we have lots of smart data people to help. Um, but yeah. a, a couple of insights from that, um, like a lot of these stats haven't changed. People are still creating content primarily for brand awareness um, and they are still, you know, primarily creating blog posts. Um, they're still making more content with more budgets, with more people. Um, but yeah, what's interesting to me is also we asked this time a few more um free text questions um, so we could get a few more sort of, you know, direct like, like quotes. Those are um, the richest responses. I love those. I, I jump right to, right to yeah, that. They are. That like finger on the pulse. It's like a Vox Pop or yeah. something. Um, and, you know, one of the questions we asked was, what is your main pain point with content marketing? And overwhelmingly, um, a lot of people said, well, people say talent, like finding people to create the content, um, but also standing out in a crowded market. Um, that's a real challenge for people. And so it goes back to this idea of like the last thing we need to do is just keep adding more content into that crowded market and making it even harder to, you know, see the signal for the noise. So yeah, just being able to be smarter about your content than ever before. Um, and really laser focusing on the customer, really knowing your customer deeply and making sure that your content is tailored for that customer, for your buyer. Um, cause it is a lot of effort to create content. And you'll waste that effort if you're just sort of going into it with no, um, like it's fine to experiment, but if you're not measuring that, then really that effort is wasted. Um, and if you don't really have a good sense of who you're targeting, what their right. needs are, um, yeah, th those things are really going to amplify the content that you're creating. For sure. It, one of the things too is uh, we can't do a lot. Of, well, we can do a lot of this without technology, but for for brands that are looking to grow, to scale globally, et cetera, they need to have technologies in place working um, strategically for, for the mission. Um, I hear, I heard you on a previous talk, make the statement, you know, when talk, when talking about, um, you know, selection of tools, uh, what's right for the organization. And you said best for me rather than best of breed, right? There's yeah. the, best of breed tools, there's the, you know, platform sort of uh, monolithic tools. But then I liked, I love that idea, I latched onto it, which is picking what's best for me, putting that together, uh, strategically right sizing it based on my personal needs. Um, tell me more about that. Yeah, for sure. So basically what we're seeing is like the market is not consolidating when it comes to tech tools. There's not, um, there's only more my, like for, for MarTech, for instance, there's only more tools coming out onto the market all the time. Um, everybody has different needs and the barrier to entry for um, using those tools is lower than ever. So it's easier than ever than it ever used to be to pick up enterprise software and drop it again and move on. Um, and so, you know, optimizing the customer experience means something different for each company. So you have this um, freedom, I guess, to piece together the the parts of your MarTech stack that are going to work the best for you. So best in breed, I mean, is it's best in breed for a reason, probably because it's best for most companies, but it doesn't mean that you should be locked in to that as a solution mm -hmm. for you when it's not the thing that you want. Um, so it's, and it is hard to know what your needs are. It's really hard sometimes to even like sit that, take that time to sit down because we're all moving so fast. 
Um, so businesses really have to think strategically about what they're trying to achieve rather than just like throwing tech at the problem. And yeah, you mentioned like the monolithic um, solutions and there was actually just recently a, a great blog from um, Joe, um, I'm going to butcher his last name, um, Chickman, Sigman, it's C-I-C-M-A-N um, from Forrester. And he is basically proclaiming that there's that the DXP is dead. And uh, we, wow. so someone from my team wrote a, a blog that kind of responded to that. But this idea that, you know, if you're a company who thinks that you're providing an all-in-one DXP that's going to suit all of the needs of your customer, you're delusional. And you really, what you need to lean into instead is this idea of a composable ecosystem of tools. And so that means that interoperability becomes key to that. Mm -hmm. um, businesses like cobble together this pastis pastiche of tech solutions. Um, and yeah, like we've had so much change over the last few years that it's really hard not to feel like you're in that mode of scrambling and pivoting. And um, But it's really risky you, to end up with all of this tech debt. So the, right. the tools that you use really need to be like easy to adopt. They need to be easy, like fast to, to prove value as well, or they'll just get discarded. And I know this from, you know, various tools that I've tried as well where you use it for a bit and you go, I don't think this is suiting my needs. And then you can drop it and move on to something else. You no longer have this lock-in um, that you used yeah. to have. So yeah, I think these these tech tools really need to be able to operate together with, you know, play nicely with each other. Um, that's something that businesses are really looking for is that integration and, and choosing those tools that are best for them. And, and this idea that you are sort of experimenting with something and it's easier to move on than ever before. But if you're locked into this monolith, it's not, it's not easy to move on. Um, so yeah, I think that's really the way that we're seeing things go now in terms of the, your tech stack. Yeah. It's like you're, you're getting, I'll call it cemented in the plumbing. You, you put down your plumbing and then you pour cement on it. And then if you want to change anything, well, you got to get the jackhammer out, get the cement out of there, redo things. Mm. Um, that's such a, that, that's definitely, you know, something uh, I'm seeing as well this idea where, um, you know, a lot of content marketers, content operations folks, like the idea of like openness and APIs on their list of what's important is like super top of the list now. Right. Versus, you know, other, I'll call it traditional uh, use case requirements. Um, and that's one of the really exciting things that we see with WordPress in that space, because WordPress is like, you know, so ubiquitous. Everybody knows it. Um, most people know how to use it, or if they don't, it's very easy to pick up. Um, and it is so, um, it, so interoperable with, with so many other systems. So I think that's something really interesting that we're seeing for at least the enterprise CMS space is that there is this real hunger to to have those systems that are going to be really quick to roll out because you want to get that time to value. You don't want to spend a year like ramping up your new tech yeah. solution. Businesses don't have that time to wait anymore. Um, I bought, we bought our house last year and it was built in 1985 and it has a built in intercom system. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's just funny. My mind went to that when you were talking about like cementing things in. Yeah. And it's just one of those things that, you know, the curtains are still pretty dated, but like they're so easy to change and the the hardwired intercom system <laughs> i don't see us really ever changing that it's kind of just like a museum piece now you know right. it's not like we use it um so yeah it's just i'm not exactly saying that it's like a house but kind of it is <laughs> yeah that's that's interesting um to see that antiquated technology in like the modern day um it tells a story though like it you know it said we have we want the ability to communicate but we didn't have you know the things that we have now like the mm -hmm. our phones etc and look how far we've evolved right and uh, getting back to this idea of like building composable martech stacks is we want to avoid having that that weird sort of antiquated fixture you know, of a piece of marketing technology stuck with us when we know there's better ways to do it. Right. And that's also why standards are so important. You know, you need to have these web standards that everybody's speaking the same language um, and you can sort of swap in and out those pieces without a whole lot of um, tech debt, without needing a whole lot of people to do this huge migration. You know, it's really... Yeah, it's important. And and to that end, you know, those tools, they, that barrier to entry, 
that low barrier to entry that those tools need to be simple and intuitive um, because you need more people to be able to to use them. We need, you know, we're do everybody's doing more with less. Um, mm -hmm. every, hiring has slowed down. You know, the economy has slowed down. We've got people getting laid off. Teams are tighter than ever before, but at the same time, you want to create more content and that, that like, I'm not a mathematician, <laughs> but that doesn't really add up. Um, so it is this way of thinking, like, how do we expand our teams? How do we expand to um, empowering more people across the organization to be content creators? And so, you know, the example we were talking about before with, um, with subject matter experts is a really good one. Um, and the other part of it is, is just having the tools that are easy enough for them to use um, that they don't feel bottlenecked by having to learn that tool. And yeah. then at the end of that cycle of content creation is, you know, measuring if a cycle can have an end, <laughs> um, is measuring. And then, then you come back to improving and iterating for next time. So yeah, the technology really needs to enable the people and enable the process, um, more than ever before, I think. And so it's interesting with, um, the retro gaming, I guess, it's like, where does that all fit in here? <laughs> Yeah. Now, uh, a lot of really interesting points brought up. So I love asking this question, you know, head of content, you go in, you know, in terms of like setting up a content strategy. Now, you know, if, if you were setting up a content strategy for uh, an organization, like 10 years ago, it, it's very different than today. Even five years ago, it's very different than today. Uh, what are some things, you know, your playbook, your sort of order of priorities, uh, what does what does that look like? The steps in setting up, I'll call it the modern day content strategy. We're, APIs are now in the conversation, right? Like there's this whole new game of um, and set of capabilities that needs to to be in a content strategy. Yeah, um, it can definitely get complex really fast. So I think as with anything else, it's just like focus is really important. Um, and being really laser focused on why are you creating content? I think that, you know, businesses need to go back to step one for that. Um, what we're also seeing is that, you know, that maybe traditional ways of content marketing, especially in B2B, creating loads of, you know, gated reports or things like that, that, you know, people are, are going to hand over their email address and then they get put into a flow and et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Um, it's just not working anymore. Um, people are, First of all, there's just so much information out there on the internet that people are less likely to um, download your white paper um, and, you know, give you your, your, and people are thinking about privacy and, you know, giving over their email address and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think we are seeing a shift that probably B2C companies have already been doing for ages. You know, it does, right. B2B does sometimes feel stuck in that sort of dinosaur era of, of our content strategy. Um, but yeah, I think... It, it's a real push and pull because you're needing to still create materials like this report, this content matters report is gated. You know, we, yeah. we need to still create materials like that, but those materials have to be more valuable than ever if you're going to gate right. them. Right. Um, it, so we, we're on the other side of that door needs to be much more worth opening. Oh yeah, for sure. And I, I think about it often because I am a head of content and a lot of our, content is targeting heads of content. So I think about it a lot right. of like, well, what do I do? What are my behaviors? Um, and it takes a lot for me to hand over my email address to download something. I would prefer to listen to podcasts, um, you know, occasionally watch YouTube videos or whatever. I, I want just a different way of interacting. I love email newsletters um, that are, but again, have to give a lot of value. So yeah, it's, it's, I think we're seeing this sort of inflection point now in B2B where like the old playbooks are not working. And so we're now trying to figure out what what is working um, and really like having that strategy is important, but also you need to be able to experiment and figure out what is working, what is working for you, have a way of measuring that and then be able to iterate on it um, because it is going to be different for every person. We're just sort of um, diverging, I guess, more than converging. So we, we are going to, you know, ev every company's strategy is going to be, um, is, is going to be unique to them. And the only way that you can really know exactly what's going to work for you is just by trying it. So again, the tech tools have to be quick, have to be agile, have to be quick to pick up um, so that that does enable that kind of experimentation. Yeah. Um, and one of the things we're experimenting with at the moment is AI um, in my team. So 
we resisted it for a long time. <laughs> you know, we would see the ads everywhere for AI it's, writing tools. It's getting pretty good. Yeah, it is. It is. So we, yeah, every time we saw it, we were sort of like, ha, 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 ha. Right. we want to, we want to keep our jobs. Thanks. <laughs> you know? um, but yeah, I think that I've been following all of the AI developments with art as well and how sort of interesting that is and how, like, I really, I don't think it's out for our jobs at all. I think we still always need that human, the human touch mm-hmm. and the human needs to kind of guide the AI, I guess. Um, I could be eating my words in 10 years when we're all of like robots <laughs> around you overlords. Um, but yeah, what we're finding now is that um, the AI is really most useful as like a brainstorming partner yeah. um, or a writing partner as well. Um, but we have to do, it's not like you can just throw in some words and it spits out a blog post and you publish it. Um, it's still needing a lot of human intervention, but it's really interesting. And, you know, again, we're just exploring it because there is a low barrier to entry. We can just sign up for a couple of months. We can have all the team just dip in there and see, you know, does it speed us up or not? Um, what tasks can we give it that are maybe more of the repetitive tasks? Um, but I don't know. I, I, I still think there's something about human creativity that we need. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, I'm always up for, you know, if a, if a bot can do it or if AI can do it, I'll outsource that a little bit, you know, but you got to jump back in and, and see what it's doing and uh, sort of consume it as if a human would add that additional sort of piece of quality back in. And one of those things, and it's it's in your, your playbook as well, which is like this personalization. Mm-hmm. would love to hear your take on um, personalization, uh, whether that's, AI aided personalization, a content strategy uh, related to personalization, sort of even like the new definition of personalization. It that's another one of those like double edge swords of can it scale, and when does like the the copy of the copy of the copy sort of fall down, lose its quality, and now you can no longer. It, so you've it, you know, you're not hitting the mark of authenticity anymore. Uh, when you think about the personalization demands today, what's maybe, what have you seen has changed from like, I'll call it five years ago when it was like the hot thing to like reality kicked in and we relied on like cookies and giving away of personal, personal information. What's like the new mindset of personalization that you're thinking about? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the way that we're like our personalization strategy is really around ABM account based marketing. Um, what is that is interesting that you bring that up because personalization is not a tool, it's a strategy. Um, and there are a million ways to do personalization. So we asked some questions about personalization in our new content matters survey. And what I was just looking at the data yesterday, last night, and what was interesting is that you know, of the people, I don't have the figure to hand, but of the people who said they were doing personalization, there was then a percentage of those people who don't use a tool for it. Um, so, you know, it's interesting to go like, well, what, what are you like, what, what does that mean for you then? <laughs> what are you, what are you doing? So I, I think that, you know, used to be, we used to heavily rely on the tools and we used to say, you know, okay, like Facebook ads, go and serve it to this demographic and, um, or Google ads or whatever. And you're right. Like now that, we don't, we, we have this new mentality of privacy. And I, I think it's creepy to be like followed around the internet with an ad. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm less likely to click on it um, in that case, you know, but the worst I, is like, whenever they're serving you up the ad, you're like, yeah, I already bought something. I don't need this anymore. Stay away from me. Right. You know, right. Being followed by, you know, one day I did some research on, I think it was a costume. Now I'm just like some costume stores are like everywhere on me mm-hmm. right now. Oh Yeah totally out of season, but, uh, yeah, I know. And it's so, it's almost like it's too obvious, you know, it's like, yeah. Oh, that's cringeworthy. Cause like it you're is. really making your, your personalization really obvious here. Um, so I think what we're, what we're seeing is that personalization requires a, more of a human touch. Like we've been talking about human. Um, so yeah, we, what I, I, I have a couple of things to say about like what I, how I get reached out to, but also what sort of outreach we're doing. So we, um, yeah, I think ABM, account-based marketing is is very popular right now. And there are tools that help you, you know, to identify like who is arriving on your site, what company they're from, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that end of it, 
like the the ops part of it is is something that I'm not as involved with, but what I am involved in is creating the content for those audiences. And so it it really does, you have to be thoughtful about it. Again, going back to everything that we've been saying is that you have yeah. to know like who is your customer, what are their pain points, what are they um what are they using at the moment that is not maybe working out for them or that we do better? Um, what, you know, what other things are kind of going on in their lives? Um, what size are their teams? All of that kind of thing. Not in like, you don't have to do that in a creepy way. You can do it in kind of a logical way, right? Like you can speak to some of your existing customers and you can start building these customer profiles. Um, so yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm involved in that, that content, creating content for those audiences, part of it. But I do think it is more of a personal outreach type thing. And I get, you know, outreach all the time in my role from people who would like to sell me software or um, like to work for me or things like that. <clears throat> and honestly, most of those just go, I just immediately trash them um, because they are, they just feel really tone deaf. They yeah. feel like generic um, and maybe I'm more harsh than some, but if I'm doing this, I have to imagine that other people are doing this too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, one, I think the most impressive outreach I've ever gotten was somebody who, um, referenced my PhD, told me a story about, um, a like theater production that they'd been to and how my PhD topic related to that. Um, Ooh, they, they had, a, yeah, they had awareness of what time zone I was in. You know, they offered me times that were in my local time zone. Um, like that stuff is really impressive to me, but that, mm -hmm. that can be aided by technology, but really needs a human. Um, and just some thought of like, we're not doing this spray and pray anymore. Like we, you are engaging yeah. actual people. Um, and again, this is speaking from my, my, uh, particular, you know, company like B2B and goals and things like that. It might not apply to everyone, but I do think that there is no substitute for, human touch for thoughtfulness um, and all of those kinds of things, you know, that, that I haven't seen. I think the AI can support us in some ways, but, you know, I have, I mean, Alexa tells my kids when it's time to go to school. <laughs> like I've definitely <laughs> used, I use robots in my life um, for that kind of thing. But, you know, then it's me that it's taking them to school <laughs> and asking yeah. them about their day, you know. That's awesome. So I want to get to, um, a lot, the last topic you, you mentioned this several times, uh, it's in the content matters report, but, uh, one of the big takeaways was tracking what we're doing with content back to revenue and it's mm. hard. <laughs> it's really hard. There's a lot of things in between a dollar and an idea within our businesses. Uh, but if you, if you, you know, you, you put the tools together with the content strategy you build for a solution like that, you know, in a, in a state where it's you know, well put together, um, analytics become super important to, you know, to tie the, the data together, uh, with the content, uh, what are you seeing some e either, uh, with WordPress VIP or with some of your customers, um, and in general, just the ones who can do it well, what are their, what are some of the characteristics that they uh, they maintain, mm -hmm. um, it, it's hard you know, to get there, but, um, uh, what does, what does good look like? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to say, I just don't know, <laughs> like right. so many people that, that, uh, we, we surveyed, you know, it's yeah. And it is really hard. Um, and the tools can get you some of the way there, but you need to know, like you said, you need to overlay your strategy onto those tools to know, what the actual context is like what um so so we um we, we acquired a, a company called parsley about um a year and a half ago or almost two years ago um which is a content analytics platform and yeah. so that's now part of our platform and it's really quite um interesting that so my team has in, involved uh, we've we've sort of adopted uh trying to be trying to use parsley very regularly, um, so trying to kind of your own champagne. drinking our own champagne. I'm glad you said that and not the dog food version. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, we, we're definitely drinking our own champagne, um, but also with the view to just, yeah, making our own content better. So what we set up, like, again, these are the good things that you can use robots for. We set up a um, Slack bot called, I don't know if you are familiar with Geekbot, like a Slack 
Um, it's a stand-up tool for Slack. So you can put in any questions and it pings the team at regular whenever you want it to and asks them several questions. And so we've recently just set up a a geek bot flow that will ping our team on a Monday afternoon and set, prompt them to open their parsley dash. Um, to, like what's one thing that's going well, what's one thing that you've learned, you know, what's one thing that needs improvement. And I think that um, the most successful businesses are going to be the ones that democratize that data analysis, like we're doing with our team um, and unlock those tools for just more people to use and make it more approachable. So that you that. don't, yeah, like you don't ha have to have one person on your team who's the data analyst. Everyone on your team can be that person. So, Cheat code, democratize the data analytics. Right. I love that. Even me, a creative, I've embraced the data. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I once you know, but you have to know what you're looking for because we might go, oh, this blog post is not doing very well in traffic. And if we were just looking at that one metric, we might kill that blog post or like rewrite it or whatever. But we have other metrics where we can say, but – there, fifty percent of the people who read this click through to something else on our site, um, and they go to our pricing page or something, you know, um, or they're clicking to another piece of related content, or they're filling out a form, or whatever it is that you can sort of see that behavior um, that's happening on the page, and so you can start to make assumptions about what the value is of that piece of content. But yeah, back to the strategy piece, you have to know where that content is falling in your strategy, like where where is it in the funnel, who is it for in order to know, to be able to read the analytics and know whether that, what means success for you and, and whether that piece has been successful. Um, so I think that's what, that's the companies that are doing yeah. it well are making, um, what we're trying to do is like build this muscle of analytics where it's part of our content cycle, our life cycle. It's just as much a part as doing a brainstorming session on what topics we should write about. It's also looking at the analytics and saying, what about this? You know, can this piece... Um, this piece is doing really well with ads or something. So how can we optimize it for that flow? Um, being able to see where the traffic is coming from. Um, and yeah, all of those kind of pieces of the puzzle, but it does really need to be overlaid with that strategy. So um, we're doing some really exciting stuff at the moment with um, bringing Parsley more into WordPress. And so yeah. when you're in WordPress, you'll be able to see um, Parsley stats right there, like, in the WordPress backend, wow. when you're writing a post, you'll have like a content helper that will help you to craft that content based on what's performed well before for your specific case. So yeah, there's some cool stuff coming down the line with technology as well. Um, but again, back to the human element um, of yeah. overlaying that strategy, having the strategy and overlaying it onto the analytics and, and enabling more people to to wear the data hat around, around your company. I love that. Yeah. Um, such a great cheat code. You've got to have called the content telemetry in place. Your content's out there. You're doing your experimentation. You've got to be super curious, listen to what's happening with the content, get that back, that, um, that back from the content, but then also the people analyze that and optimize it. Um, from there, you know, put better versions out stop doing, you know, start doing, um, that's, a just a phenomenal sort of future place to go for folks who maybe aren't there right now, who are like, I do this, I have a hard time tying it to the dollars, but if you've got your, your platform set up properly, you've got your analytics, your ability to connect data pieces together, uh, certainly it's, um, you know, aiding the content strategy. Yeah, for sure. And, and just, I can't overstress the importance of like the best tool is the one that your whole team can use. Um, yeah. that's really key because you might be, you know, we, we, we see most people are using Google, Google analytics because that is yeah. free, you know, for the basic sort of level. Um, but is it the best tool? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's really hard for some people to use. And, you know, yeah. we had, again, like we've got these free text responses in our new um, content matters survey. And I saw one that was sort of saying, we have Google analytics. I have no idea what it's telling us because I don't know how to read it, you know, cause it's, it's a bit bunch of gobbledygook. So um, yeah, you're really, anything that you can do to break down those silos of who is responsible for looking up that thing on your team and democratizing that more. I think that's just the way that we're going to see everything going. Totally. 
Awesome, Tess. Thanks for coming on the pod, dropping your cheat codes. I want uh, we're going to get the Content Matters uh, 2022 report in the show notes. Awesome. The 23 is coming out. We're going to have to get that whenever it's hot off the press as well. Yeah, aiming, aiming for January at the moment. Um, okay, we're we're on track for that at the moment. But yeah, it's it's a big you know it's our big sort of flagship piece of content for the year. Um, takes a lot of people. I have a really amazing team who's working on it. And, uh, you know, we've, we've learned a lot. Last year was our first one. We've learned a lot this year and hope to have even, even better insights this year. Fantastic. And where can folks who want to reach back out to you or keep the conversation going find you? Yeah, for sure. Find me on LinkedIn, um, Tess Needham there. And I also blog at tessneedham.blog. Um, I think there's, those links are going to be in the show notes as well. Awesome. Tess, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ed. It was really fun.